Remember in our chapter on scheduling, we learned how to schedule for basically single stage and two stage processes. That means when you're working on questions from our chapter, it's good to know how to recognize the difference between single stage and two stage. For instance, which one is this first scenario? The operations manager of a body and paint shop, that is tipping me off right away, has five cars to schedule for repair. He would like to minimize the time needed to complete all work on these cars, and you can see I was very interested in that. That is known as make span. Each car requires body work prior to painting. As if we didn't need that clarification. The estimates of the times required for the body work and paint for each car are as follows. Okay, so here are the cars, how much body work is needed, how much paint. This is the two-stage process. Oh, okay, having recognized this is a two-stage process, body work and then paint, we know automatically this is a Johnson's Rule problem. Because he said he wanted to minimize the make span, that means you need to use Johnson's rule. All right, yeah, and then the questions are about how these should be scheduled. So Johnson's rule, the easiest way to use it is to make five blanks. Why? Because there's five cars requiring scheduling. First, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And then to essentially fill in the blanks. Why? Now, how? Johnson's rule, remember how it works? Look for the smallest number. I see a one there. It's the smallest of all of these numbers. Okay, what column? The first column, body work. That means that that car, okay, that the one belongs to, well, that's E, goes as far to the front of the sequence as possible. Well, there's nobody there right now, which means E goes right in front. Now, we have scheduled E, meaning that we can lightly mark it off the list. Now what? Repeat. Look for the smallest number. Smallest number of those remaining is that 2 right there. Who's it belong to? A. Okay, time to schedule A. All right, where to schedule A? Which column is the 2 in? It's in the second column. That means take A and push it as far to the back as possible. Well, right now, last place is wide open. That's where A goes. Then mark A off the list. Okay, then, absolute smallest number, absolute smallest number of those remaining, there's this three, belongs to D, time to schedule D. In first column, push D as far to the front as possible. Well, that would be right behind E in second place. Okay, knock it off the list. Uh, smallest number of those remaining, here's a four, belongs to B. Schedule B in the second column as far to the back as possible. Well, that is now fourth place. Oh yeah, and then that just leaves C. So here's our Johnson's rule sequence that if you work on the cars, you know, body work and then paint in this order, it will get everything done as soon as possible. Now, what are the questions? Using Johnson's rule, when should car E be scheduled? Uh, first, yeah, first. Uh, using Johnson's rule, when should car A be scheduled? Uh, last, fifth place, yes, fifth place. There, done. Okay, now, next, ooh, it's another scenario. The owner operator of the local franchise of Handyman Inc. has four jobs to do today, shown in the order they were received, bold and underlined. And then there's some data. Jobs, how long, and when they were promised. And then there's questions. Oh, okay, this is a single stage or a single work center problem. There's just these things that need to be done, and the only thing we know is how long do they take. Oh, okay, now, in single work center problems, they're generally pretty simple. We just want to stay organized so we don't confuse ourselves. Because, for instance, first question, suppose he uses first come first serve priority rule to schedule these jobs. How long on average would be required for each job to be finished? Ooh, and then this is nice. Didn't have to be there, also known as the average flow time. Now, to answer that question, first we have to come up with the sequence, like the schedule, and then we have to calculate the flow times, and then we have to average the flow times, and then it's answered. Okay, now first we come up with the sequence. First come, first serve. Wait a minute, that's why this was bold and italics and underlined, shown in the order they were received, that is first come, first serve, if we work through them in that order. Oh, now I'm running a little short on room to work, so on my scratch paper, first, just to stay organized, I'm working on first come, first serve. What is the actual schedule? Well, that's easy. I just copied this list again. 
Okay. Now, what is the flow time? Well, let's see. For job W, it's going to be done first. I check the duration data. The duration data says it's four hours worth of work. That means it'll be done in four hours. Easy. Okay, now in the case of X, X will wait four hours because it's second in line. How long is X going to take to actually do? Okay, three hours. That means it'll be done in seven. The flow time is seven. Now, why? Why has to wait that seven hours? Why, look up the duration is two. Y will be done in nine. And then Z has to wait that nine hours. Plus, look up Z, one hour worth of work. The flow time for job Z, the last job in the sequence is 10. Nice check on my math is to just add up the duration data and check that the duration data adds up to the flow time of the last job in the sequence. If it doesn't, then you messed up something in the calculations. Okay, now anyway, 10 is not the answer because it asks for the average flow time, which just means all we need to do is average these numbers. Average 4, 7, 9, and 10. When you average those numbers, I get 7.5. 7.5. Oh, yeah, there it is right there. 7.5 hours. The average of these four numbers right here. Okay, there, answered. Now, if he uses shortest processing time to oh, schedule these jobs, what is the average job tardiness? Okay, we can do that too. That's just arithmetic. But you know what? Stay organized because it's going to look really similar. But I need to remember that this is shortest processing time that I'm working on. I still need to, same steps, come up with a schedule. Okay, got it. Uh, shortest processing time, let's look at the data. Shortest processing time, we would do the shortest job first, and that's Z. And then the second shortest job, and that's Y. Oh, it's actually going back up the list in the other order. Okay, that's the schedule. Now, what was asked for was average job tardiness. You have to calculate flow time first because you need that to calculate tardiness. All right, fine, flow time. Job Z is first, it's one hour. That'll means it'll be done in an hour. Job Y will wait for that one hour. Job Y is two hours worth of work, which means its flow time is three. It'll be done in three hours. X is three hours worth of work. X is another waiting another three hours, so it'll be done in six hours. And then W has to wait those six hours, and W is four hours worth of work. And notice it's that same old 10 that turns up right here. Good. Check on my math. Okay, now you say, oh, okay, I'll average the 1, the 3, the 6, and the 10, right? That's an average of 5. Um, oh, wait, that's the average flow time. This particular question asked for the average tardiness. So you got to remember to finish the question. Okay, now calculate tardiness by comparing the promise to when we actually finish. Z will be finished in one hour. Z, look it up, was promised in one hour. Oh, Z will be right on time, so zero tardiness. Y will be finished in three hours. Y, oops, was promised in two hours. Okay, finished in three, promised in two. It's just common sense. It is one hour tardy. It's one hour behind. Okay, X will be finished in six. What did we say about X? We promised it in five. Whoops. 6 minus 5, it will also be 1 hour tardy. And then W will be finished in 10 hours. Uh-oh, W was promised in 4. 10 minus 4, it's going to be 6 hours late. Average tardiness then is just add these up, right? That's 8 divided by 2, or excuse me, 8 divided by 4, duh. There's 4 jobs there, or 2 hours. So that's where we get that one. Okay, now, those are both examples of problems in which we had to actually create a small schedule. Um, now, a little bit of a hint into the mind of uh, an exam writer. Another way to test somebody's knowledge of really how well they know something is not to give them something to do, but to give them something that's already been done. It's complete and just ask them about it. Do they recognize it? This last two questions is an uh, example of that because take a look at it. This is actually a return to Johnson's rule and we already did that. But look at how the question is set up. 
Global Freightways, an international freight company, operates a small satellite center in Edinburgh, Scotland. Gee, does this sound familiar? Each day, five planes arrive in Edinburgh, bringing outbound freight collected from across the United Kingdom and Ireland. Okay. Outbound freight is unloaded from each plane, and then en each plane is reloaded with its proportions of the day's newly arrived inbound freight. When unloading and then loading is complete, each plane leaves immediately, returning to its city of origin. Do you notice the two stages? Okay, only one plane can be unloaded and loaded at any time, although unloading and loading are done by two different crews, so the two processes can happen simultaneously. This is further describing a Johnson's Rule situation. The planes do vary in the amount of time required to turn them around or unload and then reload them. Okay, to coordinate this, the manager of the Edinburgh Satellite Center has found that the best sequence with Johnson's Rule has found it already knows what it is, and then drawn up a Gantt chart, already did that extra part as well, in which each of the five planes is labeled with its city of origin. This, I said, does it look familiar, was clipped right out of your book. In this Gantt chart, time zero, okay, the beginning of the schedule, is actually four in the morning, and 0.1 hours, which is each column, is the equivalent of six minutes. Okay, that's interesting. So it's basically marked at six minute intervals starting at four in the morning. Please answer the following two questions based on this information. This is a Johnson's Rule problem that is already done, thoroughly done. The sequence has been found and the Gantt chart's already been drawn just in case you wanted to find out anything about, for instance, flow time. Ah, now, so what are we supposed to do is just interpret it. Okay, which of the following is or are true about this schedule? The Johnson's Rule sequence is apparently from this, Belfast, London, Dublin, Manchester, Birmingham. Um, okay, well, if that were true, then we would see them scheduled in that order from left to right. I do see that Belfast, see how Belfast is first? Okay, London, however, who is this in blue next? box. No, the next box here is Dublin. We don't have to check it any further. It failed right there. That can't possibly be true. All five planes will be unloaded, loaded, and returning to their cities of origin by 6 a.m. Okay, all five planes will be loaded and unloaded whenever we get to right here on the Gantt chart. This is just a question of, do you know how to interpret a Gantt chart, right? Because this is apparently from here to here, the make span of the schedule. It's how much time passes before everything is done. All right, now the question is, is, is that 6 a.m.? Well, we know that this is 4 a.m. right here, because it said so. Uh, and that each one of these columns is one-tenth of an hour, which is the same thing as six minutes. But wait a minute, that means that if this is 4 a.m., look for the whole numbers. One hour later, it's 5 a.m. That's that part right there. And then one, two hours later from 4 a.m., I mean it's 6 a.m. Up. 6 a.m. is right here, and you can see that we're still not done yet because we haven't loaded the Manchester flight or even done anything with the Birmingham flight, so that flunks. It's false. Okay, the plane from Belfast will be ready to return to Belfast by 4.30 a.m., which is to say it's flow time in clock time. Well, that right there where the loading block ends for Belfast is right in time when it's done and it can leave. The question is, is that 4.30? Well, let's see. Every column is six minutes, so this is 4.06 a.m., this is 4.12 a.m., this is 4.18 a.m., this is 4.24 a.m., of which 0.5 on that number line that's in hours, duh, yes, is 4.30. 4.30 in the morning, and that is right when Belfast is finished, so that one test is true. So only the bottom one test true. That would have been partial credit in its day. Last question. Which of the following is the best expression of the flow time of the plane from London? Well, that's just something that we read off of the Gantt chart. We have to find London. Well, that's not hard. It's the big green one in the middle. And we just, its flow time is when it ends. Oh, wait a minute. We were just remarking about that. We'd said, you know, that was right about 6 a.m. But it's asking for the flow time in terms of the numerical number line. So we're back to the original numbering, which is, it looks like it's ending just two hours out. That's the answer to the question. The 
flight from London will be finished and ready to go in two hours.